everybody, it's Cash. This is a special episode of Soul Crossings because just recently I did three separate sets of pictures for Mozart, including his transition pictures. But I also did his rivalry with Antonio Salieri and also pictures for his final composition, the Requiem in D minor. All very interesting pictures, but I thought, wouldn't it be fascinating if I put them all in one video together? So that's what I've done, and that's what this is. Uh, there's Mozart's transition, but also the mood he was in, the feelings he was having while he was writing the Requiem, and first of the three is his relationship with Salieri. Uh, I hope you enjoy them. They do tend to make sense together, I think. And uh, I think it gives great insight into what was happening in Mozart's life uh, as it led up to his death and afterwards. Enjoy. Some of you wrote and said, have you ever thought of doing the relationship between Mozart and Antonio Salieri? If you don't know who Salieri was, he was an 18th century composer of operas and a singing teacher and a big cheese in the world of Austrian music. He was Italian, but then moved to Austria and just became this enormous figure and really a respected composer. He was the mentor of people like Franz Liszt and Beethoven and Schubert and Mozart. And the problem was that Mozart was this genius who swanned onto the scene very young and started competing for jobs that Salieri wanted. And so there was a big build-up in the press about them being rivals, and it's been rumoured that, wow, maybe Salieri poisoned Mozart in the end. I think that's in the movie, Amadeus. I don't know if that's actually true in real life. But I thought what I'd do, I'd have a quick look and put them side by side. And when I went into the energy of those two, there were some strange things happening. First of all, Salieri goes over and grabs Mozart by the throat. <laughs> You're joking me! Salieri feigns innocence and says, I'm just adjusting your cravat or whatever they wore at the time. You're rough. Mozart takes that at face value and walks on. The next thing he knows, Salieri is bending down behind him with a naked flame, trying to light his outfit on fire. Mozart is taken by surprise. What are you doing? I just needed the light because I think you've got a loose thread on your pantaloons. I have no idea about 18th century fashion. <laughs> I think you've got a thread on your pantaloons. Let me look. Oh, there it is. And removes it. Mozart isn't even suspicious. He just carries on walking, thinking that Salieri has his best interests at heart. Then, as they carry on, Salieri grabs him around the neck and goes, Oh, we're the best of friends, aren't we? Aren't we great? We're not rivals. We get along just fine. But he's doing it so hard that it could dislodge a disc. It's like, oh, oh, will you let go? Mozart is beginning to wonder if Salieri is really on his side. <laughs> and it's made worse by the fact that Salieri then grabs him, throws him to the ground, oh, and stands over him and says, You slipped. No, I didn't. You threw me. There was a feeling throughout the pictures that this rivalry was very carefully engineered from Salieri's point of view. He seemed to be deeply envious wanting to be both Mozart's friend, but also beat him in any competition, which I guess is normal rivalry. It doesn't have to be uh, coated in animosity, but there was definitely that feeling that Mozart was very trusting and just wanted to get on with his work, and Salieri was deeply envious and came this close to hurting him. But each time it got to that point, he just passed it off as locker room horseplay. Oh, come on, we're just two guys hanging out. 
Mozart was way more confident in his abilities and his position as a composer. Salieri seemed insecure, frightened, and willing to take certain steps to sabotage Mozart's progress. Now, one of the more interesting requests I got this week in the comment section was for a piece of music. Uh, somebody asked me to do pictures for Mozart's Requiem in D minor. And don't be fooled by the fact that I got the words in the right order. I know nothing whatsoever about music. I think everybody knows a little bit about Mozart. He was obviously a child prodigy. He started when he was very young. He died in 1791. I've been to his birthplace in Salzburg. And it's a beautiful house, but it's also extremely disappointing. There's a spa supermarket right next door and a McDonald's right across the street. <laughs> Those people have no respect whatsoever. But um, basically, I know nothing about him. Nobody even knows what he died of. He just had some kind of swelling and pain. He was okay over the summer in 1791. And then he started work on this requiem and died before he could finish it. And I think somebody tried to steal it and say, oh no, it's mine. And his wife, Costanza, took the bit that he'd written, had it performed so that no other composer could claim it was theirs. But uh, I had never heard this piece of music before. I brought it up on my phone. And interestingly, the moment it came up on my phone, Olive, who loves music, by the way, she jumped up on the chair beside me and was immediately entranced by this music, whereas it did nothing for me whatsoever. Classical music, unfortunately, to my kind of vaguely asperger -y brain, just sounds like somebody banging a saucepan with a spoon, <laughs> unfortunately. But um, I listened to it anyway and did pictures for it, and they were fascinating. There was a small tarpaulin on the ground or some kind of sheet, and under it was somebody. But as the figure under the tarpaulin moved forward, I kept hearing the phrase, too late, too late, over and over and over again. What accompanied the writing of this music, what emotion, what thought process in Mozart's mind was possibly despair, regret, a lot of that. But also the feeling that after we die, people only remember us because of the memories we created when we were alive. So if we did good things, that's what people remember. If we did bad things, malevolent things, that's what people remember. And we are powerless to impact that after we've gone. And if we don't create memories in other people's heads while we're alive, when we die, we're gone completely. It's an expunging of the life that we had and the person that we were. He was worried that he would be forgotten. Or he had done things in his life, committed certain acts that were perhaps egregious or unpleasant or whatever, then those would outlive him and it's that he'd be remembered for. The slug figure under the tarpaulin keeps on going along the ground. And at some point, the street curved around and there were steps down. The slug carries on down the steps and begins going along a stone promenade by the side of a river. At which point, the life force that was in there was diminishing to such an extent that it couldn't carry on. And it rolled off the bank of the river into the water. We are only those things that people remember us for, was his attitude. Their memories keep us alive. And once their memories go, 
we may as well never have existed. I found that incredibly moving. A lot of you wrote and said, hey, why don't you do Mozart's transition pictures? He died in December 1791, but nobody's quite sure of what. When I went into the energy for his transition, I really had no idea what he died of definitively. Interestingly, though, when I found him, he was in a hole in the ground, a very tight hole, and it's as though somebody was pushing him down it, and he didn't want to go, and he wouldn't fit. It's like, go on, go down. I don't want to go down the hole, and he kept pushing and pushing. My feeling is that the doctors were either giving him really bad medical advice towards the end, or they were just using him like a lab rat. Let's try this. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, let's try that. Oh, that didn't work. And as well as healing him, they were simultaneously killing him. Almost as if they had a subconscious desire to kill him. On one level, he felt murdered to me, but perhaps with the best intentions, if that's possible. Eventually, I got him to go down this tight little hole. And it was very uncomfortable. It was like trying to push a pomegranate through a sock or something. It just went down and down, but really awkwardly. He landed in that symbolic cave I always see. And he was extremely unhappy and disoriented and puzzled and disgruntled. Clearly, there had been some mischief towards the end. It's almost like pushing a man's head underwater and saying, breathe, breathe, I'll drown, I'll drown. It felt like that. And he knew when his consciousness arrived in this you know, metaphorical cave that something was amiss. But weirdly, his head was so muddled and so full of stuff it's almost like he was wearing a diving helmet full of jam or something and he couldn't see straight. And it made for a very disturbing transition because he didn't really look where he was going. Yes, there was a tunnel there like there always is, but he almost missed it and walked into a wall because he was so full of thoughts and ideas and disgruntlement. He wandered up the tunnel almost absentmindedly, not paying attention at all. And when he came to the light, I thought the light was glowing extremely brightly here. It was his time, I felt. The world thinks, oh, wow, if he'd lived another 30 years, imagine what he would have created. But no, the reason he wrote 800 pieces in his lifetime, starting as a child, was because he had a finite amount of time to do it in, whether he realized that or not. And he was done. It's just shocking and disappointing how he went, that kind of drowning person thing. But because his head was so full of stuff, so jammed with ideas and confusion, he stepped into the light and went. No fuss, no appreciation of the moment, no awe. Just, he was here, blundered around, and somehow made it into the light and went. It was, it was frustrating because there is an element of wonder to this process, to accepting the hands of grace to lift you up to higher realms. That's a magical moment for most people. But for him, there was just a lot of filing to be done. And yeah, I'll do it later on. Take me to the higher realms. I'll sort out my head then. But the entire passage from form to formless and beyond was a terribly distressing thing for him, compounded, I'm sure, by the fact that he knew that doctors had done something to him to make him go sooner, whether it's just like a couple of weeks sooner, but sooner than he really wanted to go. That's what it felt like.